I'm here today with Adam Idle. He's an assistant professor of ethics at the Yale Divinity School. Um, we're here today in New Haven at Yale uh, for a conversation on the future of theology, uh, broadly construed, to include even ethicists like Adam. <laughs> Adam, uh, really glad you're able to be here today. Thanks, Matt. Um, you know, as we have this uh, conversation, right, as you say, you know, th uh, theology uh, broadly construed, uh, sometimes a question for those of us who do things as different as biblical scholarship and ethics or systematics or these different sorts of things of who we are, or how we describe ourselves. Um, take that from a different angle, though. Say, say you meet someone outside of, of the academic context on an airplane or something, and they ask you what you do for a living. Mm. Um, how do you describe what you do, and, wh and wh why, and what kind of conversation do you end up having? So sometimes I, th I say I'm a theologian. Sometimes I say I'm a Christian ethicist. But I always take Christian ethics to be a part of theology. But depending on the answer I give to that question, uh, different kinds of conversations and so I'm trying to think of actual conversations I've had on airplanes because I have I do have these conversations so part of my work in the last couple of years has dealt with drone strikes the ethics of drone strikes from a judeo-christian perspective and um, depending on who I end up talking to I might get into that with them yeah. but um, yeah usually the question if the question is just what do you do and the answer is I'm a theologian or I'm a Christian ethicist, people are either very interested or not very interested at all. Sometimes, so, yeah, it's, my mind's going blank though. Um, as far as noteworthy anecdotes, yeah. So that's fine, that's great. Um, so we're here to talk today about um, about the, the future of the field and uh, in the text that Miroslav and I have circulated, we've said some things that uh, trouble us or worry us about mm -hmm. the state of the field and I think we'll have an opportunity to talk plenty about that now and later today in, in the consultation. But um, let's start with what's, let's start on the bright side. <laughs> um, it, from your position, from where, where you are, um, what do you, what's going well in theology? What are the bright spots? Hmm. Uh, what's, going, what's right with theology these days? So let me answer that question as a teacher. I think that in the students I've been teaching over the last year, something that's been evident to me is that, perhaps not in a new way, but in a, in a very urgent sense, students are very focused on the relationship between what they're learning in the classroom and their own personal lives and um, the kinds of work they're going to go on to do. But in that connection specifically, there's a, I think, an emerging interest in a kind of holiness, a moral perfection. I'll give you one example. See if I can make this connection. I, I had some students a few weeks ago make uh, loud protests in class about a text that I had assigned for the course and the, the substance of their protest had to do with the character and the history of the theologian rather than the text. Their, their complaint was, look, we, we shouldn't even be reading this text regardless of its arguments, regardless of how, of how persuasive or important or influential they've been because of the character and conduct of the author. This is pretty frustrating actually as a teacher when you're, when you are trying to induct students into a conversation when you are trying to guide them through a text that, that really is an important text. It's, a, it's deservedly called a classic. But as I reflected on that and just began to think about it more, it just became clear to me that students, I'm thinking of millennials in particular, they, there's this a, a deep concern with with moral purity. They don't want to be implicated or complicit in any form of injustice whatsoever, and it's often crippling, and it shows up in the classroom in difficult ways, but this is 
something I'm just I'm trying to see as a as a something really important and new and I want to harness that nervous angry energy and um, and point it in the direction of of holiness understood as what's required of a people for God to dwell among them this is what people this is what students care about and I think you can see this in theology more generally I'm talking about students now but in say some of my colleagues I I attend the Society of Christian Ethics. There are other professional meetings I, I t attend. Across the board, biblical studies, Christian ethics, theology, there is a deep concern with justice and injustice. So I teach ethics, but if you look at our course catalog here, there are courses in all subfields that deal centrally with moral and ethical topics. Mm. That's, that's something good. Does that mean then that the teacher, like a, a, a teacher who is taking seriously the responsibility to teach millennials, does that mean that essentially like the teacher has to learn how to, how to instruct in holiness? That just strikes me like your, your insistence on using the language of holiness is, yeah. is quite striking to me. Um, and even I think in my more, I'm certainly on the side of, yes, we should teach for personal transformation. We should teach in order to help students um, uh, be formed as the kinds of, uh, as particular sorts of humans. But to instruct in holiness, that, that would make me feel like, oh no, no now, now I've put on my pastor hat. Um, how do you, does, does this it concern, does this millennial concern start to blur some of those lines or how do, how do you think about that? Well, no one's asked me to think about my job as a ministry, but that's how I think about my job. I, I see my work as a teacher of Christian ethics as a, as a theological vocation. So um, I do think that that vocation comes packaged with demands placed on the, the teacher. And what I think what, you, what may be unique about this generation, uh, people younger than me even, uh, it's deeply important to them that the conduct of the teacher um, reflect the subject material. Authority for the students I teach is linked up with character. Now this, is, this, can, this can be expressed in ways both good and bad. This, the emphasis you see on personal branding, mm. things like this, it's, it, it gets projected onto the teacher in ways that can be both help, helpful and unhelpful in the classroom. But so, I don't know if I've answered your question. Um, I can say more. So does, well, I mean, I'll push you further. Does, uh, does that then mean that there's a, um, like, so you talk about the negative side. I, I think the positive side would then be that students are then demanding of, of us as teachers that we, uh, are not hypocrites. I mean, that, that's a, a positive way yeah, of stating it. That's that that's a positive way, and I think that they have serious demands that they place on themselves. I mean, the the odd thing about the students I've been teaching over the last years, and this is what I did actually over spring break, in part was I started just looking for literature on millennials, trying to get a grip on the, on these students I'm teaching, which is it's they're fascinating to me because on the one hand. They demand authority. They can sometimes give expression to a kind of entitlement that seems um, undue. And yet that entitlement is juxtaposed and embodied uh, alongside a kind of vulnerability that you don't, I don't see, I think, in, in prior generations. So they're really, they're wearing their hearts on their sleeves. They're wearing, I don't know how you, how you would put this, their minds are on their sleeves too. They're, what they're thinking is so transparent in the classroom. I, they don't even have to raise their hands or voice an objection. I can just look at them and say, Brandon, what are you thinking right now? <laughs> because they, it's just evident. I, I think that the, the difficult thing can become, so that is a good thing. There's, there's a genuine interest in theology as a lived, embodied enterprise. The, uh, 
but there are some difficulties too. There, the the kind of entitlement, the um, w learning how to ex put ex those demands into expression that invites everyone in the room to actually offer up their opinion. There's some contradictions that emerge in mm. in all this, but. Mm. Well, you've talked about some of the difficulties in that particular en environment, um, but when you think about uh, the field, and we can stick to teaching if that's if that's helpful. Um, uh, what what is it that uh, that troubles you, that worries you um, about uh, about the field? And one thing that occurs to me from what you're saying is, I, I should start here. Are are we ready as teachers uh, to actually teach with the sort of students who are coming in transparent? They expect us to be transparent. Uh, I don't know about you. I wasn't trained in graduate school to teach that way. <laughs> no, um, no. I, I, I think as a teacher, it's important to remember that you are assuming a role, a kind of persona, in students' lives. It's you're not putting on the cloth, so to speak, um, but you are you are taking on a specific office, I think, and there are relationships and obligations and duties that come packaged with that office uh, that ought to be clarified for the teacher before stepping into the classroom. It's a, what students think they need <laughs> isn't always what they need but you also need to listen. Um, demands for transparency and, it, and blurring the lines between the personal and the pedagogical can sometimes actually be problematic for mm. the goals of the classroom. Mm. In the field, this is a change of subject. Yeah. As, so what are the, so here's a problem I see in my own field of Christian ethics right now and in theology more broadly. I think of myself as a theologian. One, in part, one problem is, is that I think Christian ethics really from its inception as a discipline has always had a difficult time remaining theological. And that's something that I really care about. But I think it's a genuine problem, and I think it's a persistent problem, and in part it has to do with the way the disciplines are imagined in relation to the other. A more specific problem, I think, in my own discipline of Christian ethics is right now we're trying to grapple with this question of whether one can engage in the tradition of, of Christian ethics and in theology more broadly and do social criticism in conversation with that tradition. On the one hand, we have this, there's a, there's one camp that's focused on doing the tradition or engaging the tradition, and then there's another contingency that has strong doubts about whether Christian ethics can do the kind of social criticism that it's, uh, it's in part meant to do while engaging that tradition because of the injustices that have been in some way perpetuated by, covered over by um, Christian ethics itself or mm. the Christian tradition more broadly. Mm. So it's this juxtaposition or this dichotomy rather between the tradition on the one hand and social critique on the other um, This that that's troubling to me. Is that Related to the first thing you said about your concern being that ethics has a hard time remaining theological, or maybe you could just say more about what you mean by that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> mm, you're asking me to think about some things that I need to think about more. Because of the institutional location, I think of many Christian ethicists, it becomes a large temptation, I think I'll just put it in those terms, a temptation to bracket the theological commitments mm. that fund a specifically Christian moral imaginary. I think that so, so that the demands on 
the Christian emphasis to cultivate a kind of courage are real and vital. You, this is something that I was, that I've learned from my advisors. That doing Christian theology takes courage, and it's hard. It's and it's a lot easier, I think. And it's and there are many who will ask you to in public conversation bracket the theological aspects of your work to make the work appear more rigorous, to make the work appear more relevant, to, above all, to uh, minimize the potential for offending one's Mm -hmm. interlocutors. Mm -hmm. So that's a... But I think that... So there may be some connection between this tradition critique dichotomy, but the tradition critique dichotomy is, I think, built up on the assumption that traditional sources, liturgies, um, records of communal spirituality, things like this, to the extent that they are themselves implicated in some kind of social problem, cannot then be drawn upon as resources. So we end up sawing off the branch that we're sitting on Mm -hmm. as ethicists. Yeah, we, we find in our, I find in my teaching um, that one of the key uh, skills uh, that I can, I can try to, to, to give to students is the ability to, to form an imminent critique, to actually be able to think within a system, n- n- norming other, other parts of that system, right? Yeah. And not have to kind of treat um, an entire tradition as as monolithic, but to exploit kind of internal tensions to do the kind of norming that right. I think actually we intuitively do all the time. I always give the example of students uh, that I think uh, and many an American patriot, and it's maybe hard to find them among <laughs> college students these days, and that's right. fine, that, that wouldn't probably sign up as one either, but uh, would, would still would critique, would, would say that the best idea of, of America is in you know, the first line of the Declaration of Independence, but that would require also noting that when it says that all men are created equal, that women are excluded, and that, and that uh, African Americans are tacitly excluded, and Asian Americans and any number of other folks through history. Um, but, but you say there's something in, in that document itself, that actually that individual line can be used to critique itself. It can right. be both the impetus for reform and the object of that reform. Mm. And it seems that that's, that's not um, that kind of mode of thinking, um, yeah, is non-intuitive but desperately needed. That's right, and I think faith traditions that are traditions of the book, so to speak, mm. have always lent themselves to that kind of conversation. I mean, when we're doing theology, when we're doing ethics, we are always looking backwards in some respect, concatenating texts, bringing their different manners of speaking together and to, in order to see what can now be said on the basis of what's been said mm-hmm. uh, that doesn't require an uncritical attitude toward the texts or the mm-hmm. social arrangements they endorse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Tyler Roberts uh, months ago now in, in the first of our consultations in this series mm-hmm. said uh, he's a uh, secular uh, religion scholar mm-hmm. uh, so it doesn't have theological commitments himself but he's that oh, what I've learned from Christian theology and I think what he said I, I think the academy needs from Christian theology is uh, to learn this sort of uh, hermeneutics of reception or this mm-hmm. uh, or this uh, uh, even criticism uh, the critical reception mm-hmm. right that it's both it's not uncritical <laughs> Um, right. And that there is this reception of a tradition that is still itself a mode of criticism. Um, and that theology at its, and, and he said that, of course, we thought, oh, that's, if only theology were, <laughs> right. were that thing, then you'd yeah. be totally right, Tyler. <laughs> Tyler yeah. That would be fantastic. Wow. Um, hmm. um, that, and that leads us in, already a couple of things you said lead us in, in this direction, but um, we talked about the importance of, of owning the kind of uh, particular locatedness of, say, of, of Christian ethics within a Christian theological tradition. 
And there are sometimes these impulses to want to, we want to speak to the broader world. We understand increasingly in this country, we're in a, uh, increasingly in a, uh, if you buy the analysis or not, a post-Christian, some kind of secular kind of environment, whatever it is. Maybe it's post-secular, whatever it is. If you go to Northern California, there's nothing post-secular about it. Those people, they all believe something, but it's, uh -huh. it's different anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Whatever cultural environment we're in, it's a, 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 there's a plurality of, of perspectives and, and opinions at play. Granted. And there can, be a, there can be a drive to leave behind one's particularity. Um, my sense is you, you don't want to do that. You don't want to leave behind the particularity. How, how, do, how do we relate to our own particularity, situatedness within a particular Christian theological tradition, mm. and yet still speak in public dialogue, uh, do theology, do our work for the sake of, of the world? Yeah, so... A small question. Mm, right, yeah. Knock that one out. Just, yeah, this will this only take a minute now. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't want to let go of the particularity. I don't think I could be what I am or believe what I believe and do that. I'm a Christian before I'm, an, I'm a theologian or an ethicist. So that means that my life is shaped what, by what I take to be a piece of good news. And that piece of good news obliges me to tell others about it in speech and in action alike. So I carry that into the classroom with me. I carry that into public conversation. And I think the best I can do, this isn't this will sound like a thin thinly theorized response, but I think the best I can do is say what I take to be true and beautiful and subject those claims to public scrutiny. So there's always in any claim I make, this itself as a theological judgment, there's always the assumption that I could be wrong, that what I say will be shown to be wrong, that it ought to be subjected to public consideration, and that I'll have something to learn from those considerations, that the that dialectical encounter. So from a hard question to maybe a harder question. <laughs> Um, but a more fundamental question maybe. So, so then what ultimately, we asked this question in the document we circulated uh, for our conversation, what ultimately then do you take theology to be for? Hmm. Yeah. So this is something we could talk about with respect to the manifesto, and I hope we do. I think a big part of theology, though not the whole of it, or maybe not even the primary part of theology has to do with questions about the good life. What sort of life should we live in light of this good news? What, how do we lend our lived time to the pursuit of this God? What does that look like? That's a big part of it. I think to do that, you have to commit yourself to asking some prior questions about who this God is, what this God has done. So theology in the most basic sense is about God and the relationship of all things to God. One of those things that have, has to be brought into relationship to God and spelled out and understood and deliberated about is human action and human life more broadly, and that's, that's what I do as a moral theologian. That's what I take to be the task of Christian ethics. It's the, the discipline as I understand it in my research and in my teaching, what I'm doing is trying to answer a question, which is what sort of life uh, does the gospel enjoin? Mm -hmm. Now that can look, there are different answers to that question, 
which that are compatible, perfectly compatible, but that's what I, I take myself as a Christian ethicist to be doing, understood under the broader uh, discipline of theology as a whole. That's great. That's really helpful. Um, so one final, one final question. We've talked about kind of where, where theology is at in teaching and scholarship in our public discourse, um, what's going well about it, what's right, what's, what's worrying. Um, where should we look, looking into the future, that's what we're here to talk about, the future of theology. Um, where should we be looking for, uh, for hope um, in the future of theology? For hope. Hmm. I'm going to start answering the question without knowing what my answer is and hope I'm going to hope it occurs to me as I do. I take hope to be a kind of response to the judgment that there is some good, some future good that can be gained through difficulty. So, the question about hope is a question about what it is it, that's being hoped in. I think our hope ought to be in Jesus Christ. I, we're, this isn't the first time the difficulties we'll be talking about today. It's not the first time that Christian theology has encountered countered difficulties like them. The, some of them are new, some of them are pretty old, some of them will be with us till the end of the age. <laughs> it, but um, I, I don't believe in a golden age for theology. I think that, think that things have always been characterized by difficulty so that, that theology has always taken a kind of courage, always taken a kind of hope. But if we don't, and this is an answer I guess to the question of the relationship between the theologian and the labor of theology, if the theologian doesn't have hope in that object, in that person, then it's difficult for me to see how the work can be sustained. What's, you know, what's driving us? I couldn't do it without that. <laughs> Adam, thank you so much. Look yeah. forward to uh, our conversations uh, this weekend. And thanks for meeting me. Thank you, Matt.